Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. This week we have a uh, guest, um, a special guest, uh, uh, who, who was a graduate of our department, Ilke Demir, Dr. Ilke Demir from Intel. Um, let me briefly introduce her uh, biography. Uh, Ilke Demir is a senior staff research scientist at Intel Corporation. Uh, she obtained her PhD and master's uh, master degrees in computer science from Purdue University and her bachelor degree from um, our department, Middle East Technical University, with a minor degree in electrical um, engineering. Her PhD dissertation conceives geometric and topological shape processing approaches for reconstruction, modeling, and synthesis, which pioneered the area of proceduralization. Afterwards, Dr. Demir joined Facebook as a postdoctoral research scientist working um, um, uh, on several uh, generative um, problems. Her research further included deep learning approaches for human behavior understanding in next generation virtual reality headsets, geospatial machine learning for map creation and 3D reconstruction at scale. At the intersection of art and science, Dr. Demir contributed to several animated feature and VR AR short films in Pixar Animation Studios and Intel Studios, respectively. She established the research foundations of the world's largest volumetric capture studio at Intel, which she's going to uh, talk about today, hopefully, bridging the gap between creative process and AI approaches. Prior to Prior to joining Intel, she had a brief startup experience and she was also a visiting scholar at UCLA. This was the shortened uh, version. So Ilke uh, has been really active uh, after her uh, bachelor degree and we are looking forward to uh, listen to her, uh, some of it, her work. This screen is yours, uh, Ilke. Thank you for joining. Uh, thanks. thanks for the invitation and thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, I'm Honored to be here uh, back in Metu uh, to give this talk. Um, and I'm really like, this is much more special than my, my usual talk. So just like bear with me during the presentation. Um, so welcome to my talk. Uh, today we will talk about synthetic and fake worlds uh, from a generative perspective, as you see the examples here. And as you see my 3D reconstructed version uh, flying here uh, uh, in the first slide. Um, so before we jump to that, uh, just like a very brief intro about who am I. Um, so if I, I know like um, uh, most of my, uh, most of the professors know me, but like maybe new people don't know me. So um, I did my undergrad in uh, computer, uh, uh, computer engineering in METU. Um, I also did my first inter internship at Kovan and I uh, get to like play with and develop these like little Breitenberg vehicles, which was my first step towards like anything that I'm doing like in graphics, etc. And this was like my wow moment about like, oh yeah, I, I love like robotics and uh, robotic vision and graphics, et cetera. So uh, that's how I got that um, curiosity bug, let's say. <laughs> um, then I did my PhD in Purdue, as we said, and my thesis was about proceduralization, which we will talk about today. Then I uh, did an internship at Pixar and went into this magical world of Pixar about um, like, and you can also see the posters at the background of me. Um, and um, then um, I, uh, uh, I graduated, I did my PhD and I uh, joined Facebook as a postdoctoral researcher and worked on several projects. Uh, mainly I did like computer vision and deep learning um, in different domains like virtual reality, uh, mapping and geospatial machine learning and 3D reconstruction. Um, then I did. Uh, then uh, I left Facebook and joined a startup, which is now uh, sold to Tesla. Um, and I looked at like more deep learning models and more like efficient deep learning architectures for um, semantic segmentation and autonomous driving tasks. I was also uh, concurrently a visiting scholar in IPAM in 3D deep learning for shape understanding. Um, then uh, that brings me to today, <laughs> which uh, I joined Intel and I, um, I, uh, I have uh, established the research foundations on deep learning on shapes, reconstruction, images, people, and everything that you can imagine with 2,070 gigabyte of data. So uh, now let's turn back to the journey of generative models and see how they will end up in the studio. 
let's start uh, with a flight over New York, or is it? So in Manhattan, there are approximately 4,000 unique buildings. Now, I want you to guess how many unique buildings are there in this scene? And what if I tell you um, that the information used to generate this new New York is actually uh, not as much as 4,000? Like, anyone has a guess how many buildings are in the actual representation of this uh, in the new New York? 100. Close, yes, um, 200 <laughs> okay. uh, with the in co information content, yes. Um, so today we will see how to obtain such representations to generate complex and real world scenes like this. Uh, in a nutshell, the process to obtain such representations is called proceduralization. And we start with a geometric model like this and proceduralize it to uh, extract its grammar. Um, then uh, the grammar can be edited um, and we can generate different geometry. So for example, here, the subdivided der derivatives are uh, given uh, in this uh, rule three, um, rule three A, and uh, we have like window panes here. Of course, you can do more complicated edits and it will create those army of buildings and assigning random heights. You can have a neighborhood from one building to uh, many buildings in just three lines maybe. So why do we need that? Um, the technological developments in the last century have carried us from just a few pixels per screen to infinite worlds. And this pushed the bottleneck from technology to the content. And in particular, architectural models, um, uh, computer graphics for games and virtual reality, etc., and urban planning uh, pushed this uh, progress due to the size, detail, and complexity of such models. And because of the proliferation of such areas, the demand for such models has also significantly increased. So how can we satisfy this demand? How can the content problem be solved? Well, manual modeling is a solution, but you know, humans are slow. Even the best of us <laughs> uh, is, uh, cannot create that much, uh, the, the, that much data. Um, we can use procedural modeling. However, uh, it is hard to write all those detailed grammars and hard to control uh, procedural models and derivation. Um, finally, um, what about uh, recycling those efforts and reusing such models? There are so many 3D models in the world, in SketchUp, in other sources that can be actually use them. Well, um, they usually lack high level grouping and segmentation information, uh, which hampers efficient uh, reuse and synthesis. So, is there a way to combine such approaches for efficient content generation and modeling? That's, that's the main question. Um, putting aside that question for a minute, uh, let's um, remember what this procedure modeling probably everyone knows. I will just like go very fast this part. Um, procedure modeling uses grammars or underlying systems of rules to model geometric content like buildings, plants, clouds, galaxies, universes, etc. And they are mostly uh, following the complex three grammar rules. And uh, such grammars con consist of a starting symbol, terminals, non terminals, uh, and derivation rules. And for example, to create this little building, we have this parse tree of it. Uh, the building uh, volume goes to roof and the basement, and the roof plane, the roof goes to roof planes, et cetera. So we can create this like geometric uh, shape with a simple grammar. So procedural modeling is powerful and can we use procedural modeling on already existing models to overcome the lack of control, detailed grammar writing and the uh, um, dependency on the domain expertise. So what if we can obtain grammars from geometric input automatically? Well, inverse uh, procedural modeling uh, discovers the parameters and rules of the underlying procedure representation um, of an existing geometric model and proceduralization uh, extracts the whole grammar from the geometric input. So this is a brief uh, framework, uh, proceduralization framework to um, obtain such procedural worlds from, from real, wor real world structures like this. So this can be a mesh, a point, I will explain them, but this can be some uh, real world representation and this is the procedural replication of it. So the input to our inverse pipeline may be images, meshes, point clouds, and almost any content that can be categorized. And the granularity of the content may, uh, for the urban proceduralization can vary from facades to uh, whole buildings or to individual detailed buildings. 
then the first step of the pipeline involves segmenting the input into structures that are separable from their surroundings uh, by significant changes. These changes can be like, for example, um, if you are looking at a satellite imagery, it can be roads that are different. Uh, for uh, architectural heritage, it can be the columns or whatever point clouds have. It can be the individual windows, facades, or the building components, as in these uh, examples. The second step of the pipeline, now we have the components, but we don't know their similarity. We don't know what, what looks like what, right? Um, so the second step of the pipeline labels these structures from the previously defined segments. And as in the first step, the labeling uh, can vary from um, being fully automatic based on the properties of the segments, like geometric or visual properties, or to manual labeling, uh, but we will mostly focus on automatic, uh, automatic uh, similarity detection. The third step of the pipeline organizes the segments and their labels into a hierarchy. Um, this is mostly a parse tree of the, uh, of the building uh, in different configurations. Um, this may sometimes be an adjacency graph, but it is, this, it is um, so we have the components. We know which components are repetitions of others. Now we want to design their spatial relationships, and that's, the, that's why we need the hierarchy. Um, after the parse tree is constructed, um, now we know this, uh, the relations, we know the components, we know everything. We just need the rules of the grammar. To find the rules of the grammar, uh, we actually try to find the space, the, um, the derivation rules that create that uh, instance. For example, these buildings individually may be like this, but when they're in a city, they have these transformation matrices in front of each other so that we can actually create those rules. So um, proceduralization has two parts, shape processing and grammar discovery. Uh, now we will see those. Um, I will, uh, so from here on, this, this is not a, like a deep um, talk about one paper. This is like the whole like synthetic and fake worlds. We are touching each of them. So for each paper uh, or each uh, algorithm, I will uh, leave a pointer at the bottom of the page for you to learn more about it and, or ask questions about it. But I will like go, uh, I will not go in detail to, of those approaches. So for uh, geometric shape processing on point clouds, um, we do do like basic, um, uh, actually semi-automatic uh, segmentation. Just for this approach, we do semi-automatic uh, segmentation. Um, so when the user selects some area, we run RANZAC and uh, RANZAC play fitting and Euclidean clustering to find those components. Then we try to find their similarity by component-wise feature comparison and template matching. So at the end of the, this processing, you have uh, this um, segmented point cloud. And why do we do semi-automatic? Because for point clouds, uh, we want it to be generalizable to all point clouds and point clouds have different densities, different uh, completeness levels, different uh, um, uh, similarity metrics, et cetera. So we just want to make sure that we select the uh, correct granularity and we let the use, user to decide that. Second, uh, for shape, uh, geometric shape processing on urban spaces. This is like the New York uh, example that I said in the beginning. So we have many, many, many buildings. Um, how we find the components of buildings is that we render them from top down and we move the um, uh, camera near and far planes so that we can find the change of changes. So if you are rendering this building from top down, you will see that up to here, uh, from here to here, you will see um, some change of change um, on the, in the render, right? Top down render. Um, so that's where we say, okay, this is like a vertical com component. And then we keep doing that and we find those components. Um, and you, will, you may say that like how to find those. Uh, we are not looking at the change, but we are looking at the change of change. So we cannot find quadratic buildings, but we can still find linear buildings. Anyway, so after we have all of those components, we uh, extract uh, features. And these are interpretable features, like uh, traditional features, like um, windows, window spacing, uh, albedo, uh, width, height, etc. And we put them to, uh, we cluster them with, uh, using this similarity. 
Um, at the end, for example, for these buildings, you can you may have these four clusters of buildings, um, but it is a weighted clustering. So um, if you change the uh, weight from the um, street level uh, features to geometric features, you may actually see different clusters like this uh, cluster may be divided into two clusters because the height has more importance in this clustering. Um, Going to the geometric shape processing on architectural models, uh, these are the so um, this is this approach is more uh, mesh processing on um, detailed architectural models like this, and we want to find all of those like different uh, uh, shapes, different regularity uh, components. So our approach starts with the triangle set of the input architectural models and decide uh, divides it to. Um, sort spaces that contain potentially similar parts, like like this. These are the sort spaces. But here, as you see, like the walls are all like one wall, or the ornaments are one ornament. So this is just to um, uh, make the uh, the combinatorial uh, space uh, a little bit more manageable. Let's say. Um, then uh, we define a constraint set of uh, constraint set cover problems on the uh, subspaces, and the combinatorial algorithm finds the components and the component types. And as you see in the zoom in, like the different uh, components, even if their repetition is contagious, um, we can contiguous. Sorry, uh, we can find the um, individual repetitions. Um, then we can also do geometric processing on satellite imagery. So uh, for satellite imagery, it is a little bit a different problem because geometry changes, the classes changes, etc. Uh, but as you see here, uh, we can define different objectives. So here we are trying to find the roads, and here we are trying to find the roads or buildings or land cover classification, so that we can actually create some uh, hierarchy or spatial organization on top of it. Later, we will see that we can actually create maps based on this uh, input. Um, finally, we can like. With, with very similar objectives, with, with similar optimization functions, we can actually segment physical objects. We can do the shape processing on physical objects. And why do we need it? So um, to, uh, this is for 3D printing. Um, to 3D print this object, if you 3D print it like this, um, there will be so much support structure, the uh, horizontal parts will be ragged because of the staircase effect, but, um, and it will take, much time but if you actually segment and print uh and assemble uh you can actually uh, there is no support structure the uh, near horizontal planes are printed with much more uh, with much more fidelity and you can actually um, uh, print it in one third of the time so um we define very similar component properties to the mesh segmentation approach, but we define the objective uh, from the frequency to the actual like near convexity or deviation from the model. Um, then we optimize for it, uh, as, as you see here. Um, then uh, we print and assemble. So these were the shape processing. And um, you can assume that for the cross visualization approach, we have the components and their labels. Now we want to go to the grammar discovery part. So finding the hierarchy and finding the rules. For grammar discovery on point clouds, uh, we already have the segmentation. And how do we use the segmentation, right? Um, we uh, define uh, consensus models to uh, register all of these different segments to the base segment per uh, per component, and then we uh, look for the patterns of them. So, for example, if we have uh, three chimneys like this with um, similar space, uh, sorry, six chimneys at the back too. So, um, six chimneys like this, the repetition will be like. Uh, two by three with, I don't know, um, uh, 30 centimeters spacing and 50 centimeters spacing, maybe. Um, so this is what we are trying to extract. And after we extract that, um, we can actually use it for structure uh, preserving uh, point cloud editing. And uh, for example, this model in uh, D is obtained from the model in C just under like five minutes of editing. So you you just like pull, push, copy, paste, and voila, you have the you have the model. Um, 
for grammar discovery on urban spaces, uh, we have all, all, all these buildings and how do we actually define the hierarchy of those? So we uh, propose a hierarchical simplification to organize based on similarity. And we also do hierarchical clustering to organize based on structure. So at the end of it, we know which buildings are replaceable, which, which components are replaceable with which components. And we also know that uh, because of the terminal graph that we define, which buildings occur together with other, with other buildings. Which means that, for example, if you have a landmark always surrounded by office buildings, that is actually captured as a rule in your grammar. So whenever you are creating a new city, your landmarks will always be surrounded by office buildings with the same standard deviation of distance, with the same like geometrical properties, etc. So that's how we are trying to um, uh, preserve the realism of the city when we are regenerating. For uh, grammar, grammar discovery and architectural models, it is similar to the point cloud one. Uh, from the segmented input, we define the nodes, and then we find a split tree based on containment. Um, like, for example, the building has the walls, the wall has the window, window has the window pane, etc. Then from there, we do a transformation space analysis to find those rules, find the subtrees that are frequently repeating with similar uh, geometric properties. And from there, we can actually uh, extract a grammar based on the subtrees that we find. Then this grammar can be used for many operations such as the join, copy paste, and resize operations. For grammar discovery on uh, satellite imagery, uh, we actually don't have a procedural model, but we have a hierarchical naming scheme that is uh, mimicking an automatic map, automatic street address. So we have meter markers and blocks, we have regions and roads, we have cities, and the rest comes later. Um, for meter markers and blocks, uh, we put the these, um, every five meter we put a meter marker and uh, that makes this like uh, block, num uh, block number. And then we also put a distance metric from the road. This is on the road, this is from the road. Um, we find regions that are mimicking geographical uh, properties, uh, as you see here, by clustering these road segments. And the uh, inter and intra, class, uh, inter and inter, intra uh, cluster uh, properties actually uh, give nice clusters uh, following geographical rules. So example, if there's like a main road here, this is Menlo Park, by the way. Uh, if there's a main road here, um, you, the regions actually uh, follow that because of the connectivity uh, to that road. Um, then we order them based on their uh, orientation and put the um, road number. So this is uh, our naming scheme, our new map, new street addresses. So um, these are the brief introductions of the approaches. Now let's look at the applications. Um, applications in include structure aware synthesis, both on meshes and point plots. So um, as you see here, we can do like details of the um, we can do neighborhoods like Stanford uh, Square with multiple buildings. We can do domes, etc., like Blue Mosque. We can also do uh, details like Cinderella's Castle, like original model and synthesized model. And in all those um, editing sessions, the user does not see anything about the procedural model. It's just like a visual UI, and you just copy paste and like um, um, resize and like pull, push, etc. So this this is how all of them are generated. Uh, we can do the same for point clouds, as you see here. This is the original model. The others are edited versions of those. Um, you can see that like the this, this, there is a new floor. The floor gets longer with more repetitions, etc. Um, for the point cloud, we have uh, one more um, step than meshes because you know like the density is different, completeness is different, different etc. So we define the edge of sampling, uh, automatic edge of sampling for preserving the, the density, both like within the nodes and between the nodes. For um, following that point clouds, we can actually use the procedural representation for reconstruction. 
Um, so uh, these consensus models uh, actually exploits uh, the procedural representation and beautifies the model. So this is the original model uh, in Poisson constructed form, and this is the point cloud form, um, the same model. And this is after the consensus model. So after we uh, register and resample based on based on the different repetitions of the same instance, you can see that the model gets improved both in point clouds, uh, in the de details of the point clouds and um, in Poisson reconstructed form. And we have 93% of the components completed more than 1.2 to 4x. Um, for the applications of our street addresses, like for mapping, you can see that, um, so we have uh, several applications, one uh, web-based, one uh, uh, form-based, um, and we can do inverse and reverse geo queries, uh, like clicking somewhere and asking for the address, it says 19AWA33. Uh, and you can also go to the UI and uh, ask for an address, like write an address here um, to, a uh, WK11 and it shows where to a, a WK11 is. Um, we actually uh, experimented with this new addresses in a developing country where they don't have any addresses. It's all, um, they live with landmark based addresses like see the market, take left from the market, third street on the right, etc. Um, so in, in, in our pilot study in one of those countries, we actually saw that um, using our uh, street addresses has 21.7 uh, decrease in the arrival time for the actual carriers like postmans carrying stuff to our homes. They actually used our system and have this much um, uh, time decrease in their in their job. Um, Another application is deep learning for shape parametrization. So everything I talked about is more about like buildings and how we can find those rules in those structured environments, etc. So now we are trying to do a little bit more um, unstructured domain with deep learning. So um, we uh, propose the skeleton extraction as one of the main things for uh, for such a parametrization task. And to make it a little bit easier, we actually try to, uh, we propose different domains. For example, skeleton extraction from pixels, skeleton extraction from point clouds, uh, parametric skeletons from, uh, again, pixels, and uh, skeletons from images like this. Um, here, all of them are living things for some reason, but this is like to the skeletons of not like living things, but like um, uh, more shapes, etc. Um, by the way, we also have all the data and uh, helper codes and benchmark, etc. Uh, in this um, Skeleton challenge that we organized in 2019 and 20. Um, we are also planning one uh, for 2021, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, you can download all the data and uh, play with it and submit your results to our benchmark. Another application. Now, like we are getting a little bit further from building domains to real life domain. And now we are actually going to face and human domain. So uh, DeepX is one application of the generative models. And uh, generative adversarial networks are getting popular by the democratization of deep learning. Um, so as we have more increased control and efficient training and lots and lots of data sets, um, defects are emerging because of that. And they're also like, we, we say that, oh, okay, like defects are bad, etc. But they're actually used for avatars, um, AR, VR, mixed reality applications, retargeting, in painting, etc. Oh, I forgot to play the video. Yes, these are the defects. Um, now we will go to how to actually create the place. Um, so up to here, um, it was a, a little bit older work and now it is like the newer, newer, newest work. So I'm very happy. This is the first time I'm like sharing this. So uh, if you see something wrong in the slides, don't, don't, <laughs> you can say. Um, so anyway. So, you know, deepfakes, and since 2014, like when GANs were introduced, um, the quality of them are increasing and increasing. And you can see like, this is like very high quality. You, they look like real humans, but they are not. Um, there is also uh, 
different types of deep fakes like you can change the age you can change the gender you can change um, the uh, head pose etc um, and all of them thanks to these like uh like very vari variation autoencoders uh uh, uh, WGAN, CycleGAN, LSGAN, etc. And these are all like uh, making the path for deepfakes to be more trainable and more efficient, etc. For deepfake generation, it is mostly, uh, a, it started with actually before deepfakes or maybe concurrently, uh, there was facial reenactment and uh, it is a uh, carrying facial animation from uh, one uh, from the source to the target. And there are like, this is just one example. There are many examples. You can do it by uh, morphing the face mesh. You can do it by uh, moving the facial landmarks. You can do retexturing. I think uh, Disney has a really nice paper uh, recently about that. And then you can you have the output video, which is uh, the actual deepfake version. Um, the, very first uh, approaches actually used uh, an, a simple like en en encoder decoder architecture where um, the Latin space where you, you, um, you reconstruct the face from the Latin space of another face that is encoded so that you can actually uh, preserve the facial details but apply it to another person. Um, there is also other uh, approaches, uh, for example, this is mask scan. This is relatively a newer paper. Um, in mask scan, you modify the mask and uh, you get the style from one image and um, the the mask from another image, so that you can see like the actual mask is uh, this uh, uh, image, uh, but the style is from this image, uh, vice versa. So um, almost all of those approaches are source to target so you have one source one target you are trying to create something that has something from the source and something from the target probably like the actual expression etc from the target and the mask from the source and they're almost all mask dependent or landmark dependent or like they are uh, given something uh, given an underlying semantic representation of the face they are trying to do something and most of these this, these masks are discrete they are not like mm, some blurry fuzzy or empty masks that you have um, some um, there are approaches that have um, like that are doing more like in painting work on the image but not on the mask so we propose moit um <laughs> multi-source for for multi-source face synthesis where uh, there is no source of target target there are many sources um, and uh, we learn compositions uh end to end uh with the style and the compositions which are masks doesn't need to be discrete mass that can be some fuzziness or some emptiness or some overlap on the masks so as an example, like saying it is uh, cheap, uh, as an example, um, assume that we have all of these images and their masks. So uh, what I will try to do is uh, all of these mar mar marked uh, regions from these images, we want to create a nice image, nice face that has like eyes from Brad Pitt, um, nose from Johnny Depp, etc. You know, like, uh, by the way, that's why the paper is called Men of Your Dreams. Um, so you are trying to like blend everyone and like create men of your dreams. But it's, uh, um, I'm not sure whether it's still it's a good job or bad job. Anyway, um, so um, that's why it's called Moid. Um, if we uh, copy paste uh, all of those regions into a canvas, it will be something like this. And if you copy paste all of the uh, image segments uh, into uh, in commas like this, then you will have this um, creature, which is not, a, doesn't look like a um, valid image at all. But what we do is actually create this mask from the jointly learn the mask and the image from the regions and the segments. And as you can see, our image is very much looking like a human uh, with eyes from the first one, nose from the second one, etc. How do we do that? So um, the structure generator encodes all the regions uh, and creates uh, structure codes. And then we combine those structure codes 
and generate known and random composition. So what is a known composition? Known composition is actually trying to recreate the original image that where each region is from the same one. It's like a reconstruction, right? Um, random composition is we randomly put um, all of those parts from different masks together so that we can actually try to have a random composition. You try to learn how to combine all of those masks, mask regions uh, into one composition. And then the, we decode the compositions and classify with the discriminator. So at the end, um, for example, here, uh, like uh, this is just for the mask part. Uh, if we want, if we give all of those uh, orange regions, uh, we can create this region. And you can see like the mouth is similar to this, the hair is similar to this, etc. Uh, this is the composition learning part. Um, the second part is the style generation. So uh, this is similar. Starts similarly. Uh, we first encode the styles of all segments. Then we create that style metric. So that is getting a little bit different. Um, the style. Then uh, we have the style generator, and we are trying to uh, generate from the mask. This is like a like regular uh, uh, generation, uh, like um, I don't know, star scan or mask scan. Um, for um, for a given mask, can we actually uh, get the um, get the image corresponding to that mask? However, uh, we are using region uh, adaptive normalization in those uh, intermediate layers with the style metrics we uh, uh, encoded from these different uh, style codes. So. Um, if you remember here, we were creating random compositions and non compositions. So now the generator tries to create non images, which are like from the actual mask to actual image, approximated images, which are, which are from the uh, non generated masks to the actual image, and random images, which are from random mask to random image. Um, then, um, like all of these, uh, we have uh, we give to the discriminator as the fake samples, and we also have the real samples, and we are trying to um, learn in a like normal GAN fashion. Um, we also introduce these moid blocks, and these moid blocks are um, assume it is as like um, um, adain, but it is per region, and uh, we have optional downsampling and upsampling too. Um, so that's how Moid works, and these are the results. So in each region, uh, the purple ones uh, are combined, and the uh, um, green image is created. For example, here the hair of this lady, uh, mouth of this lady, and face of this uh, guy are combined to create this lady. And you will, you may say that like, okay, this is like three segments, like uh, four segments, five segments. Where are the rest? We don't need the rest. We can actually give like don't care regions and uh, expect it to find the best or like a, 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 a good combination of them. Um, also, like uh, if you check the paper, which is coming soon, there are like more studies. Um, but this is what I want to show. So these are the most um, recent um, other in like papers. This is actually Spade, which is doing region based um, edit region. Uh, based um, um, editing. Uh, this is sound, uh, which is in, uh, in introducing the region adaptive normalization. And there's also the mask guided GAN, which, are, which is trying to find some interpolation um, between masks. So if we give, uh, but none of them does multi-source editing, uh, multi-source composition learning and, um, uh, uh, and generation. So we actually try to give different inputs to overcome that. Uh, if we so, if you remember this uh, image, this is the copy paste pair, and this is our pair, right? Mm -hmm. So if we give the copy paste uh, mask and copy paste image to these approaches, um, these uh, these are the results, which doesn't look like anything like ours, right? Uh, if we give our mask, we say okay, like they need a mask, so we can't just expect them to modify the mask. So if we give them our mask. And our uh, and the copy paste image. This is the result, and it is still bad. So that means that, like, even though our mask is given, the blending, like the regeneration, is not as good. Then we say, like, okay, for validation, uh, can we give like copy paste mask and our image so that they can create the um, 
our image from the copy paste mask that also doesn't happen for like an extreme reconstruction we said okay here is our mask here is our image reconstructed um there are some hope in this one maybe there's some blurness here but since our masks are not exact and our style generation is actually more, uh, adapting for it the results are not good at all so in b and c we see some hope um, B and C are component transfer applications where, um, so Seon and uh, mass guided uh, CGAN can actually do like uh, part by part uh, uh, changing. So you give a base mask and say, okay, I want to change the hair. Now I want to change the nose. Now I want to change the neck, etc. So you can actually do that sequential editing. Um, when we uh, do the sequential editing, uh, even though like it's a different uh, uh, application, we see that the quality is still bad. Um, so if you see the nose and neck has different problems, here there is like a mustache with the lady and the hair is blurry, etc. We also report our like PSNR, MSC, FID uh, scores here, which is better than others. So um, that's, that is Moid. Um, so with so beautiful <laughs> uh, deep fakes, are we doomed? So um, you know, like um, therefore uh, for deep fakes, there is political misinformation, uh, celebrity porn, fake course evidences, impersonation, and all of them are creating a feature with social erosion of trust, right? So for that, instead of generation, can we actually do detection? So. Uh, fake catcher is our first approach for uh, deep, for detection of deep fakes. And um, fake catcher had some media attention. Uh, so if you see any of these articles, yes, it is this paper that I will talk about. Um, so most detection approach, our orientation comes from the fact that most detection approaches look for fakeness to have its faults, find its artifacts. We say that, no, we like as humans, we have some uh, watermarks built into our nature, built into our system. And we are saying that we can actually use those for finding the uh, uh, authenticity of the videos. And uh, heart rate is one of them. Um, so um, there is uh, the heart, um, there are heart signals called PPG and BCD, and these are actually uh, these can be uh, found from the videos, as you see in this paper. Maybe you remember that MIT paper, and uh, we want to use that heart rate information as a, a way to detect defects. So the first question that we asked, like, are those signals even useful, even like visible? Right. So uh, how we formulate that problem is that given n pairs of fake and real videos, can we find an implicit indicator of biological signals? Um, and after many uh, experiments, we found that that um, for the pairwise separation problem, pairwise separation is like we have two videos, which one is real, which one is fake. Uh, we can actually have an implicit function which gives 99.39% accuracy, which is very high accuracy. Again, for set pairwise separation problem. So that means that yes, we, that these signals actually are some indicator of the of the um, of the fakeness. Oh, oh, sorry, of authenticity. Um, then we go to a generalized problem. Given n pairs of fake and real videos, can we train a detector to learn the space? Um, First, we want to do it in an interpretable way because our signals are already complex. So we want to see whether we can actually visualize the space and find it. So we train an SVM uh, on the features that we found in our experiment, in our pairwise setting, and uh, we have 75% uh, accuracy, which is not good, right? Like maybe it, features are like features were the best from our experiments, but maybe the space is more complex, so SVM cannot actually uh, separate it. Then we asked, is this space more complex? And we assumed, and we did some like source separation experiments, and we saw, found out that the, the space is complex. So we threw in a very simple three layer CNN um, to this problem, which I see, which achieved 96% um, uh, accuracy. So uh, we did um, other uh, studies and experiments. For example, we looked whether uh, how we behave against uh, Gaussian blur and medium filters filtering on the actual videos. And uh, it's still, we can compensate up to like three or five kernels. 
We looked for cross-model results like train on one, test on the other one. We looked, uh, we looked to many, many data sets as listed here. Uh, we can check the paper for the results. We did further analysis, I'm skipping these. Um, so the second uh, detection is source, uh, the second uh, defect detection is source detection. So instead of looking for an authenticity signature, can we actually interpret the generative noise of specific models by biological signals? So the main question here is that these defects have different artifacts. And can we actually trace the source of a defect to its original model? And it seems yes, and it seems that in PPG domain, these are much more visible the, with the signatures. So we built this system, which is actually very similar to fake catcher, but it is actually doing multi-class classification so that we can find the generative model. Um, and we uh, found out that we can uh, find like 97% um, fake detection accuracy and 93% source detection accuracy. So given a given a deep fake i said oh okay i think this is created with face swap algorithm or like oh it is created with neural texture scan etc um we really think that this is a new perspective to deep fake detection because as you collect all of those uh images and their sources you can actually continue detection and tracking lastly um I will talk about our eye gaze based detection, which is very recently, as of three days ago, uh, accepted to ETRA, uh, ACM ETRA. So um, you will see the paper very soon. Um, looking for more biological priors, um, eyes are actually uh, the mirror of the soul. <laughs> um, so where we look, our eyes converge, even if it's a distance object, these vectors are on the same plane mostly for most of the humans. Uh, but for fake gazes, that's not the case. So you can see that like there are many artifacts in the fake eyes and the landmarks are different and the gazes are different. So we accept all those eye gaze based features um, such as like the gaze vectors, IPD, um, 3D gaze points, um, the areas and colors of eye, iris, etc. And we uh, try to create these gaze signatures based on them. And these gaze signatures are actually a representative of the fakeness in a way or authenticity in a way that, um, for example, the um, distance of the eyes uh, almost exhibit no change for the real one uh, in during the frames, but for the fake one, it varies. Um, for example, if you look here, the um, um, PSD of the real pupil areas is significantly smaller, etc. So we create those um, gaze signatures and put them into a deep uh, classifier and um, find that um, we can have like 92% accuracy of finding the defects just by looking at the eyes, no face information, no background, et cetera, just by looking at the eyes. These are different uh, defect data sets, CelebDF, uh, Deeper Forensics, Face Forensics Plus Plus, and our own deepfake in the wild data set. And we actually have nice accuracy in all of them, even in the in the wild set that we don't know the generative source, we don't know the, uh, we don't know anything about the uh, about the model. There's compression artifacts, etc. This is like you can say you can assume that the defects in the wild data set is everything you see on Twitter, <laughs> uh, and even on that one we have nice accuracy. Um, with all of those generation and uh, detection approaches, what is next, right? So let's go to the studio. As I said before, we have 270, uh, 270 gigabyte per second of data. Um, this is the setup. And yes, it is as big. This is a human. This is the studio. And um, we propose that the future of filmmaking is actually volumetric capture and AI. Um, with so much data comes great responsibility. So we want to create all those different, uh, both like for research and for production, we want to create all of these uh, data-based AI algorithms. Um, for example, you can do a facial, facial reanimation um, of a previously a reconstructed uh, actor. Um, we actually have we actually did this because like um, um, 
during COVID, not everyone can come to the studio, so we need a way to reanimate them, etc. So this is like our own deepfake ish. Uh, we can do point cloud segmentation and point cloud cleaning, all based on different deep learning methods. We can do like a uh, face body segmentation. Um, there is like uh, work on slow motion uh, by NVIDIA, I guess, uh, but we have uh, different variations so that you can like play super slow mo. We can actually segment objects from the 3D uh, space so that like you can uh, replace these actual chairs from the initial capture to a couch, etc. Um, so proceduralization for um, we, we talked about proceduralization and uh, with so much data, we can actually have so much uh, proceduralized approaches. Uh, for vegetation, for universe, life, etc. Um, we can also do deep learning for digital humans, as I talked before. And uh, I think uh, both to merge creatives and uh, scientists and engineers, we need actually interpretable and controllable uh, spaces for everyone to understand what is going on. Um, by the way, here, um, this is actually uh, like the original capture. Um, of a Western scene in the studio. So this is the area of the studio and this is the, the uh, raw capture and this is the um, end model. So this is all actually captures in, captured in 3D and um, you can move the camera wherever you want and you can like just stop and like even the these flying things are actually captured in real time. Um, so I will end with a... Uh, um, uh, with a short demo of everything we do in the uh, studio. Um, okay, here it goes. This is Intel Studios. This one-of-a-kind studio means you can experience a look at human performance that you won't see anywhere else in the world. Thank you for listening. I can take any questions. I hope um, it was an enjoyable uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ike. That was really uh, inspiring and exciting uh, with lots of uh, practical applications. Uh, any questions from the audience? Otherwise, maybe I can uh, go over some of my notes. Okay, um, regarding the last bit, um, uh, fake catcher. Um, so I, I think this uh, biometric signals, biological signals is, is, um, is, is really interesting. But I think by additional methods, like for example, adding a biometric loss, uh, we can generate uh, fake images, videos that match uh, by biometric signals of humans. And there are new studies uh, suggesting that even the light uh, light points on eyes, the iris, are different as well. It, it is a bit different um, since it relates to uh, the case that, that you, are, uh, you presented. Even by additional methods, we can generate 
fake step match those uh, descriptions, those, those signals, right? So where, where does it end? So do you think you can generate images that can fake all these signals or there will be something dermatological appearance related or biological that, uh, that we can use to fake, to catch fake images or videos? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, so usually uh, when I'm just presenting fake catcher, I have a slide that says no, <laughs> um, but now I don't have it in this one. So um, it's not like an absolute no, of course, like in future it may, but for fake catcher in particular, um, actually formulating the PPG uh, signal extraction in a differentiable way is not that easy because you need like very large PPG data sets to actually er learn the PPG uh, signals from the face and because it's not differentiable you cannot actually just like plug it into a loss function say that like okay this is um like a ppg from the generator ppg from the other one is this one because like you don't actually know the ppg of the of the original one you can put some thresholds you can try to do approximation but it's not as straightforward to just put that the second one is like the actual spatio-temporal relations between the PPG signals in the real ones are really hard to formulate too, because we it's not just like one signal from one point, right? We have all that face grid, and from each grid, uh, grid cell, we are extra extracting a PPG signal. So you need to both preserve like the um, uh, PPG signal from your left cheek uh, should be same with the uh, with the one on the right cheek with some occlusion and illumination with uh, the temporal coherency. So it's really hard to actually formulate all of those and try to approximate all of those. So for fake catcher, um, that, uh, it's still very hard to actually like um, plug it into a biogan. Like that is our actual dream. We want to do a biogan at some point, but not right now. Um, there are just like several, uh, they're just like very small like PPG data sets, uh, not small, but like um, let's say infrequent, I guess. Um, one of them is from my colleagues and hopefully we will at some point uh, try to um, uh, integrate uh, that uh, data. Um, for I though, um, as you said, like there are even like recent papers looking at the corneal reflections and like, oh, because of the corneal reflection, you can say it is fake. Okay. Yes, that I agree. And that is actually maybe a little bit easier to uh, mimic because there are so many like ground truth that there is ground truth for that. And you can even then create synthetic ground truth for that. Just like put something and like have that like uh, re uh, speckle reflections in a simulation env environment so that we can learn from there. Um, we actually compared our eye gaze uh, based detection to the um, corneal refraction one, I guess, and uh, we actually have better results. But um, as I said, like it doesn't invalidate their point because ours is a combination of like all the like 3D, 2D eye gaze features, everything. So um, corneal reflection can be easily one of the features in our in our uh, gaze signatures, etc. And in that case, yes, you can actually like since these formulations are a little bit like easier, you can actually plug them into into uh, a biogan to have more like consistent fake gazes, for example. Okay, thank you. Any other question, comment? Erolojas question. I have a question. Yeah. Hello, Eroma Job. Merhaba, you can it's awesome. Merhaba, it is wonderful to see you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. It's, uh, it's, you, you look good. I mean, it's, it's obvious that you know, you're doing really great stuff, exciting stuff. And uh, sorry, I missed uh, uh, a little bit the first 10 minutes of your talk. But uh, based on what, what I have understood, of course, I'm a bit late to the party. Uh, and there's one important problem uh, that you seem to have missed, which is the following. It's a, uh, like whenever you have a baby born, there's this big question that, you know, who he or she looks like, the father or the mother, right? And that the, now the, when I look at this, this is like the inverse problem of your generation. And it would be, I would be really glad to see that, you know, if you switch, you take the, the baby's face as input and then you know, determine the percentage or, you know, the, the, the father and the father and the mother in that. So that, 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 that sounds like, <laughs> you know, crazy turkey suggestion of research for you. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
that, that's interesting actually um from the multi-source generation to actually multi-source detection i think it may be a nice nice formulation thank you yeah we can we can try that um actually um that may even be more like um like a, for interactive editing for example if you want to find so he proposed that the uh, moit star like newest <laughs> baby paper <laughs> uh, can be used for like de-anonymization and um, like uh, uh, sorry anonymization and de-identification tasks for example like um, all the deep fakes are very harmful and bad because they are uh, they are like trying to mimic real people right like you see obama saying some very bad things etc um, but for moit none of them will be completely one human um, so it will be harmless deep fakes, and there will be just like avatars or like nice looking people, etc. And in that case, for example, we uh, it would be nice to have uh, one simulated metric to say that okay, uh, this is a new person, but it's like eighty percent looks like Obama, so we should not actually release this or something. So that's very useful suggestion for all of those applications. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, well, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, I, I will continue uh, through my notes. <laughs> this was really uh, inspiring for me, so I, I took a lot of notes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, my my contact information is like there. Like if you uh, if you don't want to talk now, or if you have other questions, you can send an email to like for for everyone. Yeah. Um, maybe I can ask um, one one last question. Then uh, I think your your time is getting um, uh, uh, is almost up, right? Uh, or do you still have some time? I have time until 10.30. Okay, good. Uh, so regarding the previous one, um, uh, that was it, uh, that was Moit. Uh, so how, how, how do you obtain the masks or, or uh, if they are providing the data, how, how did they obtain the masks? Yeah, um, initial masks come from um, the mask GAN paper. Um, yeah, so these initial masks uh, come from the mask scan paper, and um, we um, learn the masks in a with the with the structure generator. So um, it may be um, so we don't need that. So okay, uh, for Moid, since it's special for faces, we actually have um, like uh, some meta types for faces for face regions. Uh, I think we have for 15 meta types, um, like uh, hair, eyebrows, eyes, nose, etc. cetera. Um, and that is um, like some, so we take the mask types of mask scan and um, we uh, create some meta types and we have some symmetric coupling because like when we are creating randoms, for example, if you take one eye from one image and other eye from another image, then um, it will create like some uncanny valley images mm -hmm. humans. So um, just for random compositions in the training data, we actually couple those like symmetric parts. Um, we also, uh, so, okay, meta classes, um, symmetric coupling. Um, we had one more suggestion there that I don't remember right now. Um, but like, yeah, we that that's where the masks actually come from. Uh, we also tried it on Helen data set. So um, uh, when I say mask gun, mask gun uses Celebay mask HQ data set for, uh, for their paper. We also use that um in most of our experiments but we also did some cross data set uh evaluation about um a, a model trained on Celebay mask hq we tried to generate images in helen data set which has different mask definitions different mask regions different uh like less mask classes and we still had some um okay-ish um fid scores ss uh, uh, simulate scores etc um so we within face domain we are 
a little bit like face a mask independent for the training set, I guess, because we can do that. Uh, but still, if like, for example, we never uh, tried it with like um, in the training incomplete, um, incomplete masks, for example. Um, but our compositions, as you see here, like, um, these are actually uh, not exact masks. Like you see, like there is this um, transition from hair to the clothing. And um, how this happens is if you see in the input masks, um, there are eye, eyes, nose, face, etc. but there's no clothing. How clothing appears here is that the um, structure generator sees some missingness, some fuzziness between hair and face, and then says that, oh, okay, like um, maybe I should start put some clothing there. I never see such emptiness here in between. So this like clothes, uh, this like cloth uh, mask comes from there. And at the end, when you uh, generate the image, there's some clothing there, even if we didn't give that cloth segment there. So that's, that's how we are a little bit like mask independent of course for training we need masks like that's what we are trying to learn we are trying to learn the compositions um but like uh, at the test time we don't need to give all the segments i hope that was explanatory <laughs> yeah thank you that was really good cool. um there are no other comments maybe we can stop recording and switch to your groups and continue in a, in a more uh, informal manner Is that okay for everyone or it'll jump. Do you have a question now? Notice. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I want this on the record. Okay. Excellent. Uh, I want Ilke to make a prediction uh, about the date for the first completely digitally uh, generated sitcom. Okay, without using any actors for motion capture. How far are we from that? Does it need to be sitcom? Can it be uh, um, <laughs> can it be a sports program? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's also you, you, you can make two, two of them, but I, I really like you're in a sitcom, you know, you have the character, right? Yeah. So it's it's actually, you know, more human like in the other case, you know, it's a little bit shallow. That's why I asked, you know, but you're free to make two predictions. I'm I'm not going, going to fall you know, let you go off the hook for my original question. So yeah, the, 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 the reason that I asked is I was going to uh, brag about what we did. So there is actually an AR series, augmented reality series uh, with six episodes, I guess, uh, called Soul and Science, where um, the uh, everything is captured in the studio in 3D and all of those like uh, athletes or um, performer performers are um, doing whatever they do in real time in the studio. So there are like basketball players, those like people jumping very high with pogo sticks, etc. And this famous guy, John Brancos is uh, hosting the show. So it's a real like, the, it is the first AR series um, that are are completely 3D captured. Well, these are real people, uh, but the difference is that uh, there is no motion capture. Like there is no markers, etc. We actually captured this person as is, like this, like with the with the shirt, with the actual makeup. Um, this guy on pogo stick, he is actually jumping that high with the real thing, um, and um, that is how like we want the future of filmmetric uh, future of filming to be like. You don't, uh, I mean, for CGI, sometimes you can wear, wear different things and go to 2D capture, but we don't want that. We just like want like as if it is like normal capture. We want them to be in the zone and be captured. That being said, um, prediction for um, a virtual character within a sitcom. Um, I don't think it's that hard, like maybe, Two years, someone will do it if it's not only in production. You say it's two years. It's yeah. on the record. Okay, I'll check you back on that. Okay. <laughs> so what is the catch? So if the prediction is wrong. Oh yeah. It, well, it needs to be on the record as well. Well, I mean, okay, we, we should make a bet. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I will win. You know, that's fine. In the um so in the very first case, very worst case, um, 
see, like I have 3D reconstructions of myself. I will try to animate myself into a sitcom in two years. So I have time for that. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. We'll look forward to that. Um, we can stop recording and continue informally in Turkish. Uh, thank you, uh, Ilke, again. Ilke, uh, that was really nice and interesting. And we will now continue um, in Turkish. Thank you.